Castles is an outgrowth of some of the work I've done on my website, midlandlid.com. I also write a weekly review for a Lansing newspaper, Lansing City Pulse. I've been doing that 12 years now, so 12 times 50, I've probably interviewed about 600 authors. Wow. We just don't review the book, we interview the author. Uh, last week I interviewed, um, this I can't even remember, <laughs> so many. Christopher Moore, who writes uh, comic fantasies, he's a very interesting writer. Uh, I did not get a chance to interview Chelsea Handler. Uh, her handlers don't let anybody get near her. Uh, but it's also a part of uh, some of the work I do on the Michigan Notable Books. I'm on that selection committee. And then I do contract work for the Michigan Humanities Council that does statewide lead programs every other year. Um, and this year was Andy's Ghost, and it's still ongoing. Uh, the author is Steve Luxenberg, and he's a fantastic guy. Uh, Lori Summers is going to speak, I think she said next week. Um, she's very interesting and the story about Fishtown is exceedingly interesting, so I'd highly recommend her. Um, one of the things that uh, the title of this is Cabins to Castle, and it literally, literary, literally means that those are, there are cabins and castles that uh, authors worked or lived in and you'll pick them up when I go through those. Um, but one of the things, I also, I don't just talk about the bricks and mortars. I talk about what they wrote, uh, some of their styles and things like that. And I, the way I put this list together, I take into account that the author had to be either born here, worked or went to school here, they lived there for some, lived here for some period of time, and also I tried to narrow it down. They have to be somewhat significant. That's very, that's me. <laughs> That's my decision and what's somewhat significant. Obviously, I, I'm not covering everyone that's ever written a book in Michigan tonight, so I think you'll get a, an idea as we start into this. Um, I recently noticed a sign on a wall in a really quaint little bookstore in Ann Arbor, and it says, a novel must be exceptionally good to live as long as the average cat. And <laughs> what basically that means is 17 years later, you probably aren't going to remember the book or the author. Uh, it's a very passing profession. Uh, we soon forget authors, no matter how famous they were at the time. And hopefully I'm going to correct some of that tonight with uh, some interesting stories about Lansing, or about Michigan authors. I remember, probably like you do, the first book I read that was about Michigan, and it was Northwest Passage by Kenneth Roberts. And my grandmother had it in a uh, Reader's Digest edition. And I liked it because it had Indians in it, and, uh, soldiers, and they're in the you know, sort of the outback of Michigan. And uh, later, I think in 1958, it was made into a movie starring Buddy Epson. So that was something that I, I'll never forget. And I think one of the things that influenced me is when I first got interested in where people write books is when I went to uh, Greenfield Village, uh, you know, you two of the homes. And the one home I still remember, of course, is the home where the dictionary was written, Noel Webster. And all I could think about is that dictionary we had at home was written in this building. It left an impression on me. Um, 
Let me, uh, let me tell you another thing that really got me going. There's a book, uh, it's about five years ago now, it's called Novel Destinations, and it's a literary guide to travel in the United States. So I bought the book, opened it up, went to the index. There's not one citation in that book about Michigan. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't imagine it, that they could even miss, like, maybe Hemingway, yeah. who spent 22 summers here. Yeah. So that sort of got, got me going on this, and I started to put together uh, from a variety of sources, every one I could think of and find. But one of the reasons I mentioned Hemingway is he wrote a very interesting book called The Movable Feast. It was published posthumously in 64, but he was writing about writing in Paris. And I just want to read this little, little lines to you. It was a pleasant cafe, warm and clean and friendly, and I ordered a cafe au lait. The, water, the waiter brought it to me and I took out a notebook from the pocket of the coat and started to write. I was writing about up in Michigan, and since it was a wild, cold, blowing day, it was that sort of day in the story. And then later he writes, maybe away from Paris, I could write about Paris, as in Paris, I could write about Michigan. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a quote that is often used to talk about a sense of place that lives with you your entire life. Um, a couple of years ago, a Michigan author, <coughs> Michael Cutterspiel, did a book on Hemingway in Michigan, and he showed scenes that Hemingway would write about Kilimanjaro that were from Michigan. He, he could show you the photograph of it. The man had a photographic memory, Hemingway, mm -hmm. and he carried that with him his entire life. Uh, people that I, I met who had known him, that knew him and worked for him could tell you that. He could, he could go back to a place that he wrote about and it was exactly as he wrote about it. So he had, he had a gift. But I thought that was just an interesting little thing about he couldn't write until he was away from the place. Um, I think the same thing could be said about a lot of Michigan authors. Um, Papa was not the only author to draw inspiration from Michigan. Let's start. I'm going to start. How do we do that in Michigan? We start with our, we start with our hand. Uh, I'm going to start down at the Indiana border. And we're going to go up around the coast and come back down the middle. Uh, first, I want to go to Harvard, Michigan. And that may not be exactly how it's said, but it's right where the curve of Lake Michigan and Indiana it is, right on the border. And Carl Sandburg lived there. Now, not many people know that Carl Sandburg lived in Michigan. Now, he didn't just live here a short time. He lived here 17 years. He wrote his Pulitzer Prize book in Michigan. And that's a, a phenomenally interesting story. His wife raised goats on the Lake Michigan shoreline which was not well received by neighbors. <laughs> um, and the reason they moved is the goats uh, out, outran the property they had. They moved to North Carolina. But he, he, to Michigan, he probably would have still stayed here. His wife had, had goats, and he moved, uh, moved to North Carolina. Not far from there is uh, the home of uh, Ring Lardner. You may have heard of Ring Lardner. Um, he was a sports writer primarily back in the teens of the last century. And he's from Niles, Michigan. And he had an ear for the vernacular, uh, which he often wrote in. And it's probably one of his most famous books is You Know Me, Al, which he wrote under a pseudonym, uh, Jack Keefe. And it was a baseball player that he created in his mind. He probably didn't have to do, have much imagination because he covered the Chicago Cubs for a long time. Um, one of the interesting things he did is he wrote a poem about an all-star baseball player, Vic Sayer. And I'm supposed to be clipping, by the way, so I hope you didn't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> There's Carl Sandburg, the youth, the war years. And we're at You Know Me Al, um, Ring Lardner. And that's an interesting home right there. It's, it's somewhat uh, in good shape, but it could use some tender, loving care. And I think you can find a lot of those as you travel on to homes that um, authors have lived in. But anyway, he wrote a poem uh, about Dick Sayer, who played baseball for the Cubs, and he was from Lansing, Michigan. He wrote this poem, How Do You Get Your Shirt So Black? <laughs> Dick Sayer was an incredible runner, and he was always sliding. So he wrote this poem. Uh, I'm not going to read it, because we really don't have enough time. But it's, it, he wrote it, and he did this often in the papers in Chicago. He wrote for several Chicago newspapers. Uh, but uh, Vic had a short-lived career because he broke his leg and didn't play very long. The next place uh, we're going to go is in Cass County. And Jim Carruthers is a very unusual author. He's an African-American author, uh, the son of slaves. 
uh, not many people know about him, but he wrote In the Matter of Two Men, which is probably one of the first uh, books written about race in America. Uh, and there's not much else known about him at all. Um, uh, now, before we get to Patricia, I have to, uh, probably a lot of you know Patricia, especially if you're teachers. Uh, but before we go there, I just, just and one of the things I usually do at these events, I learn about things that I did not know. Um, how many of you knew that Edgar Rice Burroughs, the author of Tarzan, lived in Michigan for a period of time? I, I, I wish you would have been around earlier. So I know that. Um, he and his wife owned a cottage on a lake near Coldwater. But he also went to the Michigan Military Academy because he was a bad boy growing up for four years, which is down in Orchard Lake. He had already written his first Tarzan book, but his second Tarzan book was written in Michigan. That was one of the summers he spent here. And now Patricia Palaka is, has anyone here met Patricia? Or, wow, are you all teachers? No. <laughs> no, really, okay. She's a, she's a favorite of teachers. Uh, uh, she's an incredibly interesting woman. Uh, can talk forever. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but she's seriously dyslexic. But she got her PhD in art restoration. She started to write and illustrate children's books very late in life. And one of the things she did is Many of her books are about teachers that influenced her during life. And one of her, one of her famous books is Thank You, Ms. Mr. Falker. And it's about a teacher that worked with her to help her overcome her reading and deficiency. Uh, her 2009 book, January Sparrow, was about the infamous Crossway Affair here in Marshall, Michigan. It was a little bit different because it was a very lengthy children's book. But she's of, of the stature that she kind of starting to tell her publisher what she wants to do. Next, we're going to go to Hillsdale. Will Carlton was a very, very famous poet uh, in the uh, 1800s. Uh, he was the informal poet laureate of Michigan. But what really, what really made him famous was the book, Over the Hill to the Poor House. Uh, and that, he became sort of the the symbol of what was going on in this country right now with the poor and the elderly. And each year they have a Will Car Carlton Festival there. It's, it's a pretty interesting event. And it's, it's nice to see a community uh, kind of honor someone that wrote for them. Um, I threw this in because <laughs> Jim Bowden, the reason is, and I think it's significant, he probably wrote the first tell-all book about sport. He played for the Yankees, and he wrote about Mickey Mantle and, and folks like that in a not very favorable life. Um, he went to Western Michigan University where he pitched. He wrote Ball Four in 1970. Now, he didn't make a fortune playing baseball, but what he did make a fortune doing was he, in, he was the inventor of chew bubblegum. Mm -hmm. And every oh, baseball player now chews it, <laughs> as you can see on TV. Oh, but yeah, that, that's how he made his living, really. Um, Slouching for Kalamazoo by Peter DeVries. He's actually from Grand Rapids. A lot of people think he was from Kalamazoo. Not, and he did not go to Western Michigan University. He went to Calvin College in Grand Rapids. Uh, and he's noted for his satirical writing about religion. So some, there was some disconnect with Calvin and his writing. Um, yeah. uh, Gwen Frosting, School of Art. We'll talk about her a little later. Uh, Gwen, uh, Will left um, Western Michigan University, this, this building and program, which is still underwritten by her. Uh, she's dead, <coughs> but uh, she is, uh, when we get into the up north aspect of this, we'll talk about her more. Um, another one, Western Michigan, oh, David yeah. Small first. Uh, David Small from Menden, Michigan, which is quite nearby here. Is, uh, very interesting man. He and his uh, he and his spouse, Sarah Stewart, Stewart, are both children, book artists and writers. Uh, I put in Stitches because it was nominated for a National Book Award for a children's book. And I joked with, uh, with David about that book would have to come with a psychologist for every yeah. children that ever, a child that ever read it. It is, it is probably one of the most gruesome books to read about a child that you'll ever read. It's a graphic novel, but it did not win. Um, also, also, one of the things I want to mention at Western Michigan University this last few years, they've gotten on the map uh, as a literary um, uh, university. <coughs> Jamie Gordon won the National Book Award for Lord of Misrule, and then one of her students, 
Bonnie Jo Campbell was a nominee for the National Book Award. Uh, that they've got some impressive um, writers there. Uh, maybe some of the best in the state right now. Um, Silver Palette Cookbook. Uh, Julie Rosso was a graduate of Michigan State University, and she moved to New York and filmed the Silver Palette. Um, I guess it was. Um, and what do you call it, a, a supply place for cooks. And she, she came moved back to Michigan and opened the <coughs> Wicked Inn in Saugatuck, which is a bed and breakfast. This, this book is uh, notable because it kind of changed how people cooked. It was the sort of demarcation demarket, de for more informal cooking. Uh, and that was kind of important at that time. Uh, okay, we're gonna go to Lake Michigan shoreline again, South Haven. The Holy Earth, Liberty Hyde Bailey. If anyone went to Michigan State University, Liberty Hyde Bailey, there's a hall named for Liberty Hyde Bailey. He's, he was, for the longest time, lost from history, but uh, he was the father of modern horticulture. But in the literary world, he wrote a book called The Holy Earth, which has been printed uh, in 65 countries, maybe two, three million copies. It's very much like uh, Henry David Thoreau. He's a fascinating writer. His home is, uh, is open to the public, and it's in a museum to him and his writing. He wrote 65 books. Mm -hmm. so it's, when I was a student at MSU, we didn't really know any of this. <coughs> uh, here's one of the first castles that you'll find, and it's at uh, Castle Park, Michigan. And the reason it is on this tour is L. Frank Baum, uh, in 1899, I believe, spent a summer there. And if you've been there, of course, in the castle, they have a yellow brick road. There's a, you can pick out the colors. There's an entire book written on how Castle Park influenced this first book. Was it about, uh, he later bought a um, cottage there, and his family would visit very, very often. One of the interesting things about uh, Baum is he also wrote a book called uh, Tamawaka, which is, is a, a spoof of the community of Makatawa, that and it was banned by the public library of Detroit because it was too upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> what year? Um, 57. <laughs> it's one of the oddest stories ever. And because of that, the Detroit News serialized it. <laughs> but it, it got a lot of national attention. It's very funny and uh, it just drew national attention because it was probably one of the most delightful children's books and upbeat children's books and they banned it. <laughs> uh, next, we're going to go to East Grand Rapids. And East Grand Rapids, whoops, did I jump too fast? The Polar Express. Chris <laughs> Malfrey, incredibly talented uh, artist and author. Uh, one of the things he's mostly known for is the book, The Polar Express. And the reason that's interesting to me is the Polar Express, the actual train, is in Owasso now, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but it was on the campus of Michigan State University for 40 years, 30, 40 years. It just sat there and never ran until a uh, group from Owasso came and got it and got it going. But that, he did not know that. He did not go to MSU. He went to the University of Michigan. But the train was 1225, so he used that in the book. He wrote, uh, one of his more recent books is about a Bay City woman, it's called Queen of the Falls, and she's the woman, Anne Edison Taylor, that went over the falls and lived. Um, it's it's uh, one of those children's books that is not terribly uplifting, but not a nice life after she did that. The story going over the falls is great, but after that, her life kind of fell apart. Um, the next, Stuart Edward White, who grew up in Grand Rapids, he's noted for writing outdoor stories. And what's interesting, after he wrote this book, he and his wife began writing books, and they claimed that someone was channeling their writing. They didn't go far after that. That just didn't work at that time. It might have, might have worked today, but not then. Uh, people looked at him a little askance. Uh, another author nearby there is Meindert de Jean, another graduate of Calvin College, and I think he was the roommate of Peter DeVries. And he was a winner of the first National Book Award for Children in 1969. It was Journey from Pepper, Peppermint Street. And, but one of the things he's really noted for, in 1955, he won the Newberry Award for The Wheel on the School Bus. The Wheel on the School. And he uh, was a tremendous uh, 
author, and he's gone now. Uh, we're going to go to Spring Lake, and one of my favorite uh, illustrators, I guess, and he was, he was an author too, but he's been mostly lost from time because he goes back so far. But Windsor McKay uh, is known for mostly his little Nemo cartoons that ran in daily newspapers. Uh, but what wasn't known by him, and you can read that on there, is Walt Disney, was, he influenced Walt Disney on what he would then create. And uh, Windsor McKay's children were at the dedication of Disneyland and when it opened uh, in, in uh, on the West Coast. So without Windsor McKay, there would be no Disney probably. Um, it's an interesting story. Uh, his little Nemo's are like dream stories. They're fascinating stories. Um, this is another unusual. Who would have thought that Edgar Lee Masters had anything to do with Michigan? Uh, you probably know that uh, he wrote Spoon River Anthology. And he did this, uh, much of it near Spring Lake, where he had a, uh, he rented a rooming house in something called the Oaks. And even though this is about Illinois, he pretty much finished it on the, on the beaches of Lake Michigan. Uh, he was a successful lawyer. Uh, he was in partnership with Clarence Darrow. And he wrote a poem about Michigan um, on a night, about a night on a beach near Saugatuck with a woman friend, not his spouse. <coughs> because he had a terrible divorce after this. But one, two of the lines go, next day we went to Grand Haven, for my desire was your desire. Uh, his wife must have been able to read. So she didn't last long. Uh, I think probably a lot of people might recognize this. I threw it in because of my love for libraries. It's the Hackley Library in Muskegon. It was donated by uh, lumber baron Charles, Charles Hackley. And it, it kind of represents the grandeur of the area. It's, it's just a beautiful library inside. Um, I've bought many of the books they've tried to get rid of at their book sales because of the uh, book imprints on the inside. They're just fantastic artwork. Um, now, this is not a Carnegie library, but there are about 60 Carnegie libraries at one time in Michigan. There's, uh, I think, 54 left. So I try to visit those when I go to a city. Marshall does not have one. Um, now we're going to go to the exciting time, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, he spent every summer here from the time he was almost born. Uh, it's an amazing story. And that's that book I talked about, Picture of Michigan's Hemingway by Michael Fettersfield. So the sites uh, that Her Hemingway really was close to were Petoskey, Harbor Springs, Walloon Lake, and Horton Bay, and then of course the Upper Peninsula. But you can go two now, you can go to Petoskey, you can stop at the museum downtown, and they'll give you either a walking tour or a driving tour, so you can see some of the sites like the Horton Bay General Store, uh, the Perry Hotel, the Carthy's Barbershop, Eva Potter's Rooming House, the Carnegie Library, <coughs> the Bronze Diner, all had something to do with Hemingway, or he wrote about them. Um, Horton Bay General Store, store for example, is on Boynton City Road, and that appears in Hemingway's short story, Up in Michigan. The Fox Inn is almost identical to when Hemingway stayed there. And they do allow people to stay overnight, but it's pretty Spartan, I'll tell you. It's the same mattresses that Hemingway probably saw. <laughs> <laughs> it has, it has, your host is probably one of the more unusual people you will ever run across. He's the son of the original owner, and he has an interesting <laughs> way of doing business, he'll, he'll copy things uh, of Hemingway's writings and he'll sell them to you. Like one page or two page for a quarter. He's funny. He's quite a character, but it's worth visiting. He'll try to tell you that Hemingway got married in this little tiny chapel behind the store, or behind the inn, that was not fact. Uh, Hemingway got married to Hadley at Triangular Law in Pinehurst. Uh, <clears throat> 1917 was an interesting time for Hemingway and the family. His Horton Bay General Store. Hemingway often took a ferry across the lake and ended up, ended up there. Mm -hmm. um, it's Windermere Cottage. That's where he, he grew up as a, during the summers. His father built that his first summer when he was born. Um, Windermere Cottage, I've been in it. I'm very fortunate to be in it once. And it's, it's, um, they live in it, so it's restored. But it is 
pretty, it was an interesting feel there. It's hard to explain to know that Hemingway wrote, wrote here, he grew up here. Um, you know, he did a lot of odd things there. And it's, it's just a kind of, it's open very infrequently. You just have to watch constantly. Um, Next, we're going to take a look at Baby. Um, Baby was a Chautauqua, um, was a permanent Chautauqua, and so they had hundreds of authors come through there during that era. Uh, one of the interesting things is Hemingway took a trip over to Baby to try to sell the editor of Red Book, which was very big at that time. His name was Edwin Balmer, a short story, but he didn't like it, so he didn't buy it. It's kind of interesting. But Hemingway did a lot of, from what if you've been up there, they'll talk about the hijinks. He, it's alleged that he and friends would break into the place and drink. Except there wasn't supposed to be booze there, so that kind of story <laughs> fell apart for me. But they, they broke into some of the cottages and things. Um, if I could recommend to you, go back, if I could recommend to you uh, a Hemingway story or a collection of stories to read, it would be uh, the Nick Adams stories. But, 20, uh, 24 about Michigan. There's some of his earliest writings. There's some of the best short stories ever written. Uh, probably Big Two Hearted River is taught in every college and high school in the country, what it was at one time. Um, and then the 10th, there's a short story, a real short story called The Killers. The Killers was uh, made into three different movies. Uh, it's an interesting story about two men sitting in a, in a diner talking about killing someone. Um, also, what's being also what's being published right currently is a 14-volume set of Hemingway's letters, and those are fantastic reading. There's two volumes out. One quick letter I'll quick I'll read to you is uh, one of the most famous Dear John letters of all time. Uh, the letter was sent to Hemingway in 1919 by Agnes Kurowski, who's the nurse who ministered to him after his war injuries, and Hemingway must have known that the letter was not going to go well. He had been writing her for several months. And it opened with the salutation, dear boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and the final clincher was, I am still very fond of you, but it is more as a mother than a sweetheart. <laughs> it took him a long time to get over that, but in Farewell for Arms, for any of you who've read it, um, the prototype nurse for that is this woman, and the nurse is Catherine Barkley, I think. Uh, what's interesting is he has her letter, his letters to her have, dis to her have disappeared. It's, it's been said that her husband, mm -hmm. she was getting married right after this, uh, destroyed them all. But it would be interesting to see both sides. Um, okay. Also, each fall, Pasti is a very little known festival, the C.S. Lewis Festival. Of course, C.S. Lewis wrote Chronicles of Narnia. This has been going on for, I think, 20 years at least. So it's every fall and it's late October. Joy of Cooking. Um, I would say maybe this might be the most famous cookbook ever. Uh, it was written in Charlevoix. And it was illustrated by Irma Rombauer's daughter. And she wrote it in Charlevoix, not Bayview, because her husband had committed suicide the year before. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to get away from Bayview. So she wrote that book in Charlevoix. It's probably, uh, I can't tell you how many grains in, oh, probably over 100 now. But the earliest ones are interesting because of the recipes for game and things like that. Mm -hmm. how, to, how to clean a skunk or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> this Andrew J. Blackbird, he wrote the history of the Ottawa people in Michigan. He's one of the most uh, probably revered American <laughs> Indian writers. Uh, he's incredibly well written. Um, and he was involved in several of the major peace treaties in, in uh, U.S. history. And it's the first real history of the tribes written by someone who lived that life. Nearby in Harper, or excuse me, back on the road to Benzonia, is probably the author of one of my favorite books, is Waiting for the Morning, uh, Bruce Catton. He didn't win the Pulitzer Prize for this. He won, he won it for one of his Civil War books, of stillness at Appomattox. But uh, there is a very interesting exhibit uh, at the local library, which was once the boarding school he lived in. And they have a very special collection. And one of the things I did not know until I uh, went there was that he was a carver. He, he carved very intricate little people. He was really amazing. That's something that just, and he started writing late at night also. Also, he wrote a tremendous 
number of books. He's considered one of the noted Civil War historians of all time. Um, Glenn Frosty. Glenn Frosty, I, I met her in 86, 87. Uh, she's just an amazing woman. Um, if you don't know her, she writes. Um, she, they're, they're short poems. Uh, uh, she does all the artwork in them, or did all the artwork, excuse me. She cut them into linoleum and then printed them on 100 year old letterpress print, uh, paper. Um, those, they're very beautiful books. Uh, they're very collectible, hard to find. They're still in pop, they're still being, still being issued, but the first editions of those are very difficult to find. We're going to make a short stop before we get into the UP. <coughs> and Margaret, to uh, stop at Mackinac City, Francis Margaret Fox, who also lived in Bay City and wrote her first book there called Farmer Brown and the Birds. This is her home, it's still there. She moved back to the Straits area and built this stone house and named it Happy Land. And she wrote 50 children's books there. Her papers are in the Clark Historical Library in Mount Pleasant, if you're ever there. Uh, they have a great collection of children's books, and they're very open to let, let people look through them, or at least look at them. Uh, okay. Now, we've got to go across the bridge. And the bridge has been probably a half dozen children's books in the about the Magnum Bridge. This is one of my favorite. It's by Gloria Whalen. Uh, Gloria Whalen is a um, National Book Award winner um, for a book called Homeless Bird. But she, picked, she did this book with someone from the Lansing area, Giesbert von Frankenheisen, who's an incredible wildlife artist. And this is called The Five Mile, The Poem of the Five Mile Bridge. And there are a number of others uh, on, about Mackinac Island. What's interesting about this book is, if anyone remembers G. Men and Williams, he wore a green tie. Well, Giesbert von Frankenheisen he is from another country. And all he saw was black and white ties. I mean, black and white photographs of it. The tie in the original book it read. It's really neat. <laughs> it's really fun. They changed it in the second edition. But it's just, and he goes, I didn't know. But Jane, here's another, this originally started as a cabin. Um, it's the home of Jane Johnston Schoolcraft and her husband, who was more famous than her, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft. He was the American Indian agent there in the 1700s. And it's right at the right down by the river there, just to the I guess it would be east of the locks. And what's interesting about this is, until relatively recently, uh, people didn't understand that Jane Johnson Schoolcraft was the author of most of what Henry Schoolcraft wrote, um, and also was probably the inspiration for one of the more famous books ever written, The Song of Hiawatha. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote that, but he also admitted he borrowed generously from her writing. Mm -hmm. uh, she's considered the first American Indian who wrote in a literary style. She could speak both languages. Uh, she was, she was uh, a medis, so she was half uh, Chippewa. Mm -hmm. And she is tremendously under, under uh, represented in American literature. Um, and I think uh, a book called The Sound, The Stars Make Rushing Through the Sky, which was a translation of her Indian name, uh, helped put her on the map again. One of our, and there's the song of Hiawatha, it's not Hiawatha. Uh, Chase Osborne, probably one of our most interesting governors. Um, lived in Sault Ste. Marie, that's his home, it's a bed and breakfast now. Uh, Chase Osborne, in addition to being governor for two years, 1911 to 1913, was also a prolific writer and he wrote a lot of books about exploring and visiting foreign countries. He also wrote many books with Stella Nova Brunt, who was his adopted daughter and his deathbed wife. Uh, they traveled together uh, extensively. Uh, he's, buried on, um, he's buried on Sugar Island, and if you go there, you see that his home just was allowed to go into the ruins. You can still see it. You can see where his library is. No books, but you can still see it. Um, some of the, what's interesting about this, this is the, the rapids, obviously, the Sioux Rapids, and Rene Galani was a missionary who was probably the first white person to write about 
Indian fishing in the Sioux. And he visited that area in 1670. And he was probably the first person to taste whitefish. And he wrote about it, and it's very interesting. Uh, he said, the river, St. Mary's, he's talking about, forms at this place a rapid so teeming with fish called whitefish that the Indians could easily catch enough to feed 10,000 men. And then he goes on, it is true that the fishing is so difficult that only Indians can carry it on. No Frenchman has hitherto been in, able to succeed at it, nor any other Indian than those of this tribe or who are used to this kind of fishing from an early age. But it had to be very difficult to stand in canoes that would fish like that with nets. Um, what's interesting even more is 250 years later, Ernest Hemingway wrote a story about fishing for rainbow trout in the same place. And he wrote it for the Toronto Star Weekly in August 28, 1920. And he would write just beautifully about how the large rainbow tri trout guided through the rapids and halted at the pools by Ojibwe and Chippewa boatmen. Well, what's interesting about this is historians who really know Hemingway can find no record that he was ever in Sault Ste. Marie. It's a fish story. Um, now, later that summer, he did write a very famous story about a fishing trip to Horton Bay, but it's likely he was never in Sault Ste. Marie. Okay, we're going to go to the western UP, but on the way, has anyone seen this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, it's a crazy story. William Donaghy, who was the author and illustrator of the Chicago cartoon strip, The Teeny Weenies, and they were about these tiny creatures who lived under um, rose bushes. And they lived in a pickle barrel. And so he had his house built up here in a pickle barrel in Grand Marais. And I think it's the, I'm one, I can't remember now if it's still the tourist area, I think it is. I don't know where the travel tourism information is, but it's very unusual, these little creatures. They're very fun. Another place in Grand Marais that if you stop at the bar called uh, Brown, or excuse me, the Dune Saloon, that's where Jim Harrison, who's probably one of Michigan's most famous writers, uh, hung out. And he invented uh, his, one of his characters there called Brown Dog, which appears in about a half dozen of his novellas. And it's a half Chippewa, half, half white. And a very unusual fellow. Um, but that's where you met him. It's in the bar there, and it's right here. That could be that it's not Jim, but that's what the bar still looks like. Mm -hmm. Not far from Grand Marais is the Cini. And the Cini is, in reality, in Hemingway's writing, the big two, the big two hearted river. Um, and he just liked how big two hearted sounded. So Seeney became the big two hearted. Hemingway was also a poem, which a lot of a poet, which a lot of people don't know. He wrote eight, he in fact there's a book called 88 Poems of His. He's a very he was a very accomplished poem. He's a better literary writer. But he also wrote a book called Three Stories and Ten Poems. And one of the poems was this one about Along with Youth. And that's a limited edition broadside. But it, it's sort of he went back. The last time he visited the UP, before he left Michigan really forever, he visited one other time. He wrote this poem, which is a very sad poem about saying goodbye to his former life. Kind of like, I've grown up, I must leave. And very, very interesting. It's, uh, it's in his first book that he published in uh, Paris. Now, the UP would not be the UP without Indian country. And Bill Caputo, very famous author, uh, visits the UP often with Jim Harrison. And he wrote Indian Country. And Indian Country is probably the first book written about uh, post-traumatic stress. It's a fascinating book. Um, and I put it in because it, it was the first book, likely, that was written about it. The first, he was a decorated uh, Marine in, in Vietnam. He was a captain of the league. And what's not known about Phil, he was probably the first person prosecuted for war crimes in Vietnam. He, did, he wasn't convicted, but that, that had to weigh heavily on him. Really did. He was not guilty, but it was pretty, pretty ugly. Um, anatomy of a murder. We've all heard about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've seen it. I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where the famous murder actually took place at Big Bay Lumberjack Tavern. Um, one of the things that's fun about um, visiting this area, the Marquette area, in Big Bay, Ishpeming, you know, besides the food, is they have a literary tour all marked out for you. You can go and get it, and drive along, and see all the spots where that were in the movie. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And for those who don't know, 
this book was 1958. Um, Robert Traver was um, still on Michigan Supreme Court. His, he was writing under the name Traver. His name was John Boker. Uh, when this book came out in 58, very shortly after he resigned from the Supreme Court, um, this book was on the New York Times bestsellers list for 65 weeks, 29 weeks of number one. It's it amazing. Um, the new movie certainly helped. The movie came out in uh, right one year later. There's in the floor, they have the famous scene, the, the famous piece of art that opens the movie. Um, that's the Lumberjack Tavern. This is in a printing plant now, but it is a cast party. They signed up. every member of the cast including Duke Ellington, signed the entire wall. It's amazing, but it's in a printing plant now. You have to get permission to go in and see it. But everybody's there. You can see Robert Traver's there. And it's pretty. It's a pretty phenomenal thing to see. Uh, he also in Marquette is a young adult. Well, yeah, of course, why you're there. Yeah. You have to, they do have in sciences. <laughs> Anatomy of murder shot glasses. I think that was contributory that night to the murder. Too many shot glasses. Peter White Library, I almost forgot about this. Uh, it's a beautiful library for one thing. But if you ever go there, ask anyone at the desk or anything the top, about the time the Rolling Stones came. Uh, why, you're asking why are the Rolling Stones in Marquette? They are roadie for like 40 years, lived in Marquette. When he died, they came, they flew the, they flew the plane there. From uh, Toronto, where they were practicing, and they just hung around until the funeral. And then when the funeral started, they all walked in, and sat down, and you know, didn't make a big deal out of it. But about halfway through, they got up and went to the front and sang "Amazing Grace." Oh. Oh. And the people left there. Oh, wow. So they just got back on the plane and left. Great job for having spent the day. But when they walked in there. People looked at them and they uh -huh. look like somebody. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, this is the Boker grave. Um, my spouse Mary back there. I asked, I asked the obvious question. Where's his wife? Where's she been? No one had ever asked that. <laughs> I didn't notice it. <laughs> but about, I think it was later that year, I was talk, doing a talk in Bayview. And I told this story, and some guy in the back of the room raised his hand and said, I know where she's buried. I said, where? Lake Superior. Oh. He, was, he was her great grandson. So they dumped her ashes on Lake Superior, so there's no gravestone there. No. It's sort of one little strange fact. Dandelion Cottage. Um, Dandelion Cottage is a book by Carolyn Clement Watson, who wrote numerous young adult books in um, Marquette under the name Carol Watson, and she named, named her book after her body, which is white and yellow, still there. Uh, and that's in downtown Marquette. Okay, as so we head uh, south again, you know, Rudyard Kipling. What, think about Rudyard and Kipling. There's a Rudyard and Kipling in Michigan. And when Rudyard Kipling found out about that, uh, he wrote a letter to the head of the Sioux Line Railroad. And he thanked them for naming two cities after him. <laughs> <laughs> that letter is available in an archive. And then he wrote a poem called Kipling's Michigan Twins. And I'll, I'll come back to that and read it at the end, because I, I want to get through this entire thing. I don't want to lose some things here. OK, Mackin Island, Grand Hotel. Mark Twain spoke there a couple of different times. He gave one of his most famous lectures here. He was paid $345. And he appeared in a dozen Michigan cities as he was lecturing, trying to pay off his debts. And one report from the Petoskey reporter said an audience would pack the Grand Opera House from the orchestra railing to the top row of the rear gallery, greeted Mark Twain when the curtain rose last night. Every seat was sold, and over 100 chairs were brought in to try to accommodate those who wished to see America's great humorist. Even then, many were turned away. The receipts were $524. Uh, also on Mackinac Island it is the stone. It, it uh, commemorates a famous book called Anne. Uh, and what's interesting about it is the constant Fenimore Wilson, uh, who is a, was a niece of Fenimore Cooper, uh, wrote this book. And later, uh, a group of people who lived on the island uh, put this tablet there 
And it's every year there's a, at the end of the season, they do a poetry reading there. She was a close friend of Henry James and went to visit him in Paris. And um, she died and she fell out of a window. But it, there was some belief that she died because he rejected her. He, he, they, were, they wrote hundreds of letters and back and forth to each other. Ejected or rejected? <laughs> 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 she died under suspicious circumstances. <laughs> I like him. <laughs> it's, also, it's also said that Edward, Edward Hale wrote a man about the country, a mission house on that front porch, oh. looking out across that mm -hmm. um, John McKay. Yeah. He, wrote, he wrote in a niche, you know, okay, I'm not telling you. He wrote, wrote in a niche, he wrote about uh, movie stars, and, like Chaplin, and each summer he was at the Grand Hotel. They, had, they put him up there for free, and he was sort of the writer, writer in residence. And it's a kind of a special time. Um, and he wrote a number of books, and let's see, I'm going to go back. He wrote about. Uh, Laurel Hardy, Charlie Chaplin, George Cohen, James Cagney. He, he focused on celebrities. Uh, both uh, De Tocqueville and Henry David Thoreau visited Mackinac Island, which not many people know. Mm -hmm. And they were on just their sort of exploration trips uh, to see what the country was like. Huh. Iola Fuller, many of you might have read this book. It's Blue and Feather. And she used Mackinac Island as a setting uh, for historical fiction. And they, they're in the early Indian War, so in the 1700s. Um, and she wrote one of the greatest lines about the Straits. It says, and there was always water, for Mackinac is where the lakes meet in the Straits, flowing between Lake Michigan, Huron, and Superior. Seas of sweet, sweet water on every side, and in every direction pure. And across the bridge, you're going to go see this guy. Oh, yeah. Anybody that has children or grandchildren, Jonathan Rand is the most popular children's author by far in Michigan. He writes you know, the strange stories, um, you know, like the monster that attacked Petoskey, and they're all clever. They're pretty much formula, but kids love them. He wrote the book Nahum on Mackinac Island. Uh, we'll quickly go through here, Clark Historical Library. Uh, it's worth a stop. They have a good Hemingway collection. Uh, they have a collection of uh, his post movie posters from very many, uh, many countries. They have an amazing collection of KKK material that was used to write a book. Um, they have maybe the second best collection in the University of Michigan having the first of children's <coughs> book art. It's just a fun place to spend maybe a couple hours at. Um, before we go to Saginaw and Theodore Repke, let's pretend we stop at um, a skillet where a felon named Jack Henry Abbott was born. And he wrote one of the first prison modern prison books, and it's called In the Belly of the Beast. And it became so famous that many stars and authors tried to get him out of prison. Norman Mailer was one of the leaders in that. He was out of prison six weeks when he stabbed a man to death and he went back to prison. And back in the, in the 50s, it was a very much a cause celeb about getting this man out of prison. Okay, we're going to stop at the home of Theodore Retke, who is from Saginaw, Michigan. Theodore Retke is one of Michigan's most famous, and the nation's most famous poets. He won two Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, he lived in this house. It's still there. It's a museum now. Behind this house, when he lived there, were, were um, greenhouses. Mm. They inspired him. Most of his writing is about the natural world. He's an interesting man. He suffered from depression most of his life, um, and he was teaching at MSU in 1935, and um, he would go out on the kind of the rail of the building to, to emphasize a point, a three-story building to his students. And he got dismissed um, because of his depression. He says, he wrote to a friend, hell, I don't care what happens to me, whether I go nuts or my entrails hang out, mm -hmm. but I can't stand being mindless and barren as I've been. But after that, he wrote his best writing, incredible. He had a stamp issued for him last year. And something else that happened, not just in Saginaw, but in many places around the Midwest because of Paul Bunyan. But one of the more famous <coughs> books on Paul Bunyan was written by James Stevens in Saginaw, Michigan. And it's pretty hard to say exactly where Paul Bunyan and the Blue Ox were 
first written about, but he wrote one of the first ones in 1932. Right nearby in La Pierre is Marguerite D'Angeli. They named the library for her there. She was a Newbery winner for a book called Door in the Wall. And Anna DeAngelis is noted because of her children's book on took on issues that no one else ever had done. She had a, a book on racial prejudice that was uh, very early on, and she also had a handicapper in her book very early on. Um, she, she won the Newbery Award and very famous, famous author. A short ride, uh, oops, short ride down, down I-75, you're going to go to Flint. Many people came out of Flint, and they tended to write uh, gritty stuff about the auto industry. Um, ben Hamper wrote probably still the best book ever about the auto industry, being a shot worker. It's called Rivet Head. Uh, Michael Moore came from there. Uh, John Siska, who's a famous children's author, came from there. He tends to write his books for young boys. He really believes that those kids need, not, need to know how to, to uh, read. But also, uh, uh, Christopher Paul Kurtz, who is a children's author, he now lives in Canada, worked on the line right alongside uh, Ben Hamper. They knew each other. And so it seemed, even in that daily grudge of putting things together, these guys came out of there and became very famous authors. Here's our second castle. James Oliver Kerwood. This is a real looking castle if you've been to Kerwood. They have a festival in June also. And James Oliver Kerwood was probably one of Michigan's most famous writers. He wrote adventure stories. Uh, he often used dogs in his stories. Um, one book, for example, is called Kazan, the Wolf Dog. There were several of those written. And he had 35 films made from his books. Um, he also wrote the first book ever on the Great Lakes in 1909. He was an environmentalist. He's got a mountain, you can call a mountain UP named after him. Uh, he had established a hunting camp up there. But one of the interesting things about him, he died very, relatively young because he got bit by a spider in Florida and they didn't know what it was. Owasso is also the home that we mentioned earlier, about 1225. That's where they sort of reinvented this train. Um, in violation of copyright by even using Polar Express with 1225. They, they protect that with a vengeance. So they can't call it that. But it is up and running again. It was off for a while. And you can ride it on weekends. And the most important time that it's written though is by little children at Christmas. It is full and it's probably sold out already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the movie? There's a movie called The Polar Express. That's where it came from. That's what I was wondering. They used that train, the actual train, that came and took measurements and digitized it. But they will not allow them to use the word Polar Express. Mm -hmm. they can't do it. They got sued. Huh. Uh, also, uh, just uh, down the road, MSU, Glendon Swartow wrote Where the Boys Are. 1960. He was a professor at Michigan State University. He also wrote a number of other books. This was an unusual one for him. He wrote The Shooters, They Came to Cadora. Um, he wrote a lot of westerns. And with his spouse, he wrote a lot of young adult books. Um, but this is a great laureate on the campus of Michigan State University because everybody thinks it was filmed. Part of it was filmed there. It did not happen there at all. He shot it on a back lot, and, except for the scenes. Lauderdale. Russell Nye, The Unembarrassed Muse. He won the Pulitzer Prize for the book Brown and Rebel. But what's interesting also about Russell Nye is he created popular culture studies as we know it in this country. And he, was, he wrote a book on The Wizard of Oz being banned in Detroit, for example. Mm. But he collected what he called cheap literature. And when he died, he had a huge collection. It's now in the MSU Special Collections comic books, paper pulp fiction, it's amazing. He sort of created this whole study of what was called popular, popular culture. Um, interesting guy, I had a class from him. I don't remember if I got a good grade. <laughs> but I wouldn't tell you either way. Uh, Ray Standard, whoops, Ray Standard Baker, now, he didn't write this book, but the reason I show it is Ray Standard Baker uh, won a Pulitzer Prize for a series of books he wrote on Woodrow Wilson. He was the confidant of three presidents. Um, if 
you read Bully Pulpit right now, he seems a, he's like a, every other page. He was probably one of the premier muckrakers of this era. Uh, but one of the other things he did is he collected books on bees. There's about 300 books on bees <laughs> at the MSU library that he collected and gave to him. Uh, but Ray Stander Baker uh, kind of lost to history, even though he won a Pulitzer Prize. But he also wrote a series of books under the pen name David Grayson about rural living. That are sort of uh, romantic books about living in, in a rural life. Incredible author, and like I said, he's not, I bet you one out of 10,000 on our campus of MSU can tell you who he is. There's all named after him. Pete Jen went to MSU. He wrote the first tell all probably in football, North Dallas 40. Played basketball at MSU, but basketball at that time didn't pay any money, so he played for the NFL. Um, he wrote about a dozen books and a great writer. Um, he had a tough life because he got really injured in the NFL and uh, he never really wrote the book he wanted to, he said. Um, but he did write a book about he and his son and Little League Baseball, which to him sort of, sort of, sort of was what he wanted to do. Never popular. It was almost made into a movie. Silent Spring, a tie with Michigan State University. It's Michigan State University discovered Dead Robins. And Mitchell Carson uh, found out about it. She was working for the federal government at that time. And then she later, later wrote a book about it called Silent Spring. But without MSU and their research, this was, they would never know what was killing, killing the animals. Huh. And that was this is one of my favorite stories, is Jim Hort, Tim Harrison. Uh, Jim uh, was born in Reed City, grew up in Hazlitt, Michigan. He's written 40-some books. He considers himself a poet first, though. Has anyone read Jim? He loved BD. Yeah. And that's Doesn't have much. a social security number, but a driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just warn people, uh, if you read Brown Dog, you better have an open mind. <laughs> but, he, but he is the nicest human being on the face of the earth. He'll do anything for anyone. He's a little non traditional. Uh, Jim went to MSU, but at the same time, he went with this guy, he became great friends, Tom McGuane. He wrote The Sporting Club, Panama, a number of other books. He lives in Wyoming now, in Montana. Uh, Jim was uh, from uh, Rose Hill, and the two of them uh, cut quite a swat when they were younger, let me tell you. They were known everywhere across the country. Uh, a third person is Richard Ford, who wrote, uh, among other things, he wrote Independence Day, he went to MSU. Independence Day is not the book about being invaded. It's a book about uh, a man growing older, and it won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he was there, he overlapped with, with Harrison and Tom McGlain, and they were all close friends. Dan Gerber, another, that's a Gerber. Uh, Dan Gerber was there at the same time. He, he was the first person to publish, probably, Jim Harrison and Tom McGuane in a publication called Sumac. And it was mostly short stories and poetry. And he underwrote the whole thing. And it's been said that he might have underwrote Jim Harrison and early career. But Jim had no money. Nobody was paying for his money. So Dan Gerber is a. He's kind of a legend on the campus of MSU because he did those things. Flannery O'Connor. <coughs> if you could figure out what Flannery O'Connor has to do with Michigan, remember I told you I wanted to put in some things that were significant. She came to Michigan, no, it's the first time she'd ever left Georgia. And she came to Lansing, Michigan. She was invited by the women's club to speak. And the reason there's a chicken there is what she was noted for as young girl, she taught a chicken to walk backwards. And it became a newsreel that went worldwide. And she always thought, what can I do to do that? So if you want to go Google it, Flannery O'Connor chicken, it is the funniest thing you'll ever watch. It's still there. But she, she had a very acerbic way of writing. And she didn't always do it in her books, but she did it in her letters. And her trip to Lansing is well documented. And she thought Lansing was a little stuff. Uh, and at the same time she's telling her, her host, what a wonderful time it is. She's writing nasty letters back home that are in books now. One of the things uh, 
flashes in Lansing, she wrote in a letter home. Everywhere she went, she, she said, they asked me if I think the university stifles writers. And she says, my opinion is that they don't stifle enough of them. <laughs> <laughs> There's many a bestseller that could have been prevented by a good teacher. <laughs> she, uh, she's a very great writer. If you get a chance, read her. Um, one, of, one of the odd things that makes it also real, real interesting is she, uh, she wrote a style of writing that she first gave the speech about it's an important uh, speech that she became famous for. Uh, that's why it included it. And, and again, there's a lot of letters that make fun of Lansing. Yes. Fortunately, everyone's dead. Mm -hmm. Just John Herman. Uh, in fact, tonight in Lansing, they're at uh, the Historical Society of Greater Lansing. He's at Herman Home. They're celebrating uh, the Herman family. John Herman was a nephew of the original Herman family, which was a major tailor in Lansing, they had 35 tailors. But what makes John Herman interesting is he, um, he was raised uh, in an affluent family, and he, among other things, went to Paris. And because his families, um, and the Hemingway families, both summered at Walden Lake, he walked into Paris and became friends with Hemingway. His family, because they made suits, would send Hemingway suits. So Hemingway wore his suits. Uh, John Herman, um, while he was in Paris, met a woman named Josephine Hurst, who was a famous, became a famous novelist herself. Uh, but what also makes him interesting is he had one of the first books banned in this country called What Happens. And it's a very, I mean, today they're reading this in junior high, so. But mm -hmm. it was uh, confiscated in New York and burned. And there was a lengthy uh, court case about it. That was his first book. He wrote two books after that. In 19, I think it was 1928, he won the Scrivener's Book Award for the best short story. He beat Thomas Wolfe and sold with Fitzgerald. He was a great writer, and he had a chance of becoming a great writer. Uh, unfortunately, he drank too much, and he became involved in the Communist Party. And he became part of the Ware uh, cell, which involved Peter Chambers and Alger Hiss, and he was the go between. He never was prosecuted, he went to Mexico after World War II, where he hooked up with the Beat Generation, which is amazing because they were down in Mexico City at that time. And, in, and he, he died there. But one of the things that is claimed that he was at was William Burroughs um, shot his wife there uh, by accident. Uh, he was uh, under the influence of drugs or alcohol. He was trying to do the William Tell thing to shoot. Mm -hmm. But it's claimed, but I don't think it's true, that he was at that, he was there after that. But he carries with him quite quite an interesting uh, record on his own. Another one is from Lansing is I'm Owen Har Harrison Hardy. And he wrote about Lansing this, at the time. This was an incredibly famous book because he was seen as the person who was going to inherit Salinger's writing. And uh, he decided to go to Hollywood instead and write scripts. He made a lot of money. Died young. Malcolm X was from Lansing, Michigan. Uh, he grew up there as a teenager. Uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, probably one of the more important books ever written in this country. It's always on someone's top ten. Just out there, the most recent book written about Malcolm X by Maribel Manning. Manning wrote that book but did not live to see it written when he died. He won the Pulitzer for the last few years. Uh, Paddle of the Sea, Holland Sea Holland, a favorite of a lot of people uh, children's chose this book. I didn't know uh, when I started this. He was from Wesley, Michigan. It's about 20 minutes away from Lansing. He grew up there. Uh, he won a Caldecott for Paddles of the Sea. And it's a short drive uh, there from Lansing. But one of the more interesting things that happened in, in the museum there is, as a small child, he'd draw on his closet, in the back of the closet. And they're beautiful sketches. Somebody cut them out and saved them wow. in the museum. And it's amazing to see what a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old can draw. Okay, we're going to go through these quickly. This is probably the first book written about Michigan, uh, about a literary book. Uh, it's by Carolyn Matilda Kirkland. She wrote this book in eight, uh, about 1837. And she was one of the first settlers in Pinkney, Michigan. They didn't stay long. They went back to New York. And she wrote a book, uh, The book. one of the books was called uh, Forest Life. And the book 
these books do not romanticize uh, early living in Michigan. They're very awful. Uh, and she went back to New York and became friends with Gertrude Stein. And no, excuse me, she ran a Gertrude Stein-like salon that included Edgar Allan Poe, Henry James. She became very famous back in New York. Her books are considered as probably the most accurate assessment of what it was like to really live on the frontier. Um, invited to pop-up uh, person, uh, Robert Savoo is from Pinkie, Michigan. Has he's probably done a hundred pop-up books now. Uh, Donald Goins, little known, but he wrote probably the first hip-hop style um, books. Uh, he was a heroin addict out of Detroit. He wrote about a dozen books. Still all in print. At one time, he was the most popular selling African American writer. Uh, interesting books. He just did, many of them were made into movies. Um, but they, and I think one of the things that catches people's eye is that they had titles like Dope Fiend, Poor Son. And they were very blunt. He died a he died a drug land uh, killing death. And he was married to Malcolm X's sister. He died in that killing too. Joyce Carol Oates. This book is probably one of her most famous books. It takes place in Michigan. She taught at the University of Detroit, and she, she lived across the, the river in Canada for a while. Uh, but she has been uh, of saying that this Detroit is the place that she learned how to write. Oh. And she never quit. <laughs> I can't tell you how many books she's written. Yeah. Dudley Randall, uh, he was an African American who published probably some of the first poet, African-American poets, modern poets, in his book called, in his press called Broadside Press. And he was really responsible for the black art, art movement in Detroit. Um, if you ever see a Broadside Press, pick it up and take a look at it. They're well done, they're beautiful books. Um, he, made, he made a real difference for uh, really black authors. Robert Heath, he was the, uh, also an uh, African-American poet. Grew up in Black Bottom in Detroit. His book, uh, Middle Passage, uh, is extremely famous. He taught at the University of Michigan. And he was on a postage stamp this last year, too. Uh, Harriet Arnau Simpson, the doll maker. She, she wrote, she came from the South. Uh, the doll maker is an inter interesting story. It's made into, a, I think, a movie maybe twice now. Um, I know I'm going through these quickly, but I want to catch up so that if you have any questions. John King's books in Detroit. If anyone loves a bookstore, that's one of the world's largest bookstores. <coughs> it's built. There's more than a million books there on those floors. It's an uh, interesting place. You can find pretty much anything you need there. Uh, Cream Magazine, the reason I mention that is uh, it's not a book, but many people came out of there that wrote books. David Marsh, Bill Marcus, Lester Baines, Cameron Crowe, uh, people might remember from the movie Almost Famous, worked at Cream. So very started the careers of a lot of writers. It was a rock, one of the first rock and roll magazines. Uh, Elmore Leonard died last year. Uh, Elmore Leonard uh, probably was, in modern terms, probably Michigan's most notable writer. Uh, wrote 45 novels in his career, most uh, combination of westerns and uh, thriller mysteries. And he's just an amazing writer. Most recently, he had his short story, Raylan, developed into the TV series. And uh, I think he's going to be missed because uh, an awful lot of people love this man. He's a great guy. Okay, Rusty Cadence. I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but it is in Gross Point. It's a bar with Jack Kerouac. I don't know. Not many people know that Jack Kerouac married a woman from Gross Point, almost at gunpoint. Because he was in prison at the he was in jail at the time, and a deal was cut. If he would marry this woman, he could get out. It's much more complicated than that because it involved the murder. But he then moved back to Gross Point with this woman, and he lived there for six months while he worked at Fruhaw uh, Truck. Uh, the place he was staying was the owner of Fruhaw. Uh, the woman he married was Frankie e. Park. And <clears throat> what's interesting is, um, he would go here after work and just hang out because he was terribly depressed about being in Gross Point. And then, but later, he and Jack Cassidy would visit Gross Point in the car two or three times after he was divorced. And then one time he walked 
the six miles from downtown Detroit to Rose Point to see her. And there, these trips, if you look carefully, are detailed and on the road. Um, the other thing is there's an interesting connection in Ann Arbor. Jay Platt, who owns the bookstore there, told me once that he, he, his wife, came in, and Jack Kerouac's first book called Town and Country. She said the setting was Ann Arbor. It wasn't Lowell, Massachusetts, as everyone thought. And Jay asked, well, how could that be? He said, well, my father had a farm out in Dexter. He would come through here and hang around. So he used Ann Arbor as the setting for one of his books, even though it's, it reads like it could be Lowell. Robert Frost, he spent quite a bit of time at the University of Michigan. And his home is in Greenfield Village. When it was bought by Henry Ford, he had no idea that Robert Frost would ever live there. He had just told his move. He just liked how it looked. It was a classic home. <coughs> he wrote one of his most famous poems here. It's called Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening. He was there on and off because he was being paid like as a visiting professor. And they quit paying him, he quit coming. <laughs> One of the most famous noir novelists, Rita Wolf, Whistle Stop, made into a movie. Um, she was from uh, Grass Lake, but she went to the University of Michigan. She won a Hoplit Award while she was there. And other people that have won that award are like Arthur Miller, Death of the Death of the Salesman. Um, Dark Tunnels is written about the University of Michigan, and it is a book by a mystery author, and, and I look, his name is Ross McDonald. Ross McDonald went on to write about 25 novels. He won, a, he won an Agatha Award. His wife, Margaret Millar, also won an Agatha Award. But they lived and went to school in Ann Arbor. And this takes place in the tunnels under the University of Michigan. So it's first mystery. One of the more recent things that I haven't added here is just this last week, the mystery bookstore in Ann Arbor, Aunt Agatha's, it's been there about 20 years now, won what's called the Raven Award from the Mystery Writers of America. And it goes to a non-writer uh, who's contributed to the mystery genre. And it's, it's a very special award. For example, Bill Flint won it. Because he shot the good mysteries. But I think I'm going to stop here. What I'd like to ask is any questions or any suggestions of someone I should add. James Finnerer, quick everybody. Yes. Legend or reality? Yeah, no, he was. He was. was visited here. He visited here. Uh, he went. He went to the. Uh, this is James Finnerer Cooper. He visited here uh, for the longest time. What's the state-owned museum that's down this way? Does anybody know? It was a, they had a room that allegedly he lived in. There was absolutely no historic information to prove it, and that he wrote it there. Uh, but if you read it, you can pick up, yeah, that he went, he went, he came from Michigan, he visited Mackinac Island, where his niece lived. The name was on a lot of the old extracts. Yeah. Have you been property? Yeah, he owned property here. But, but oh. whether he stayed in this, this uh, stagecoach, They've got a, I have a postcard with him. Legend. His room. Legend. Probably. Yeah. And you know, history's history. Is how much was nice. it? Nice people agree on. Yeah. But he definitely was in the mission. And how much he spent writing about this area and the swamps to the west of it. Who knows? Anyone else? Anyone have any suggestions? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, John Millares. Yes. I know. From Marshall, Michigan. I yes. learned. <laughs> Uh, and I've read his material too, and I did not know he was from Michigan. He died very young. He was only like 51. Mm -hmm. It's not that out. But if you look at there's places oh, around town that are referred to in his book. Do you have to check out the circulation at this time? But it's not going to be I think your presentation was fascinating, and I don't have any suggestions, but do you have any insights into why men of a certain age seem to love cowboy? Stories of cowboy movies. <laughs> and, and no, <laughs> you know, I, I I think I do know because um, I know a lot of people read them. Um, and if you go back and read some of them, like Elmore Leonard, they're beautifully written for one thing. Uh, they're simple tales. They're the Sancho Paza. I mean, it's, it's, you're on a quest. You're going to write wrong, 
That's why people like some mysteries, like Blue Childs, are basically about an errant knight roaming the countryside, making things right. I, I think that's in everybody's dreams. I mean, that's kind of how we, most of us our age grew up, is seeing those kind of stories. It's the only thing I can figure. Uh, but there are a lot of modern Western writers. They're popular again. Kind of unusual. They still sell. And one of the things I didn't touch on, but the whole aspect of self-publishing is mm -hmm. changed the publishing world phenomenally, and I think for a good thing. Speak yeah, to that a bit. Pardon? Speak to that. Well, self-publishing in the last, really, the last five years, anyone can publish a book and do it easily and inexpensively, you know, 25 book dollars. But a lot of very good authors who couldn't get published emerged from self-published books. Or there's authors, like there's a man in Lansing who is uh, self-published. He writes only e-books. He sold 800,000 e-books. I'm not good at math, but, you know, four bucks a book. Yeah. Quite a chunk of money. So people can become successful as writers in, in non-traditional ways. Uh, it's a lot more to wade through, but I think it's a good thing. And there's things being written that otherwise you never would have gotten there. There's a lot of junk. There's 400,000 books published a year now. How many? 400,000. Minimum. I, that was last year, so maybe it's double that. But they're worth, some of them are USA, very worth. USA, over, over the USA. Over the USA, yeah. But a lot of those are worth reading. Does anybody else? Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Oh, yes, sir. How did you uh, come to get into the history of authors in Michigan? Back in 1987, I worked for the Michigan Sussex Tenure Commission. And we delved into some of the authors. We put together guides to Michigan authors. And it just kind of fascinated me because I found out about a lot of people that I didn't know about, you know, that I had no idea about. And some of them were when I went to school with. And it was kind of, it was kind of unusual. So I think that's it. I just kind of focused on Michigan authors after that. Uh, something that fascinates me because it's a sense of place. There is, a, there is um, what I would call a Michigan narrative in literature. We write about the Great Lakes, we write about the environment, we write about automotive, many cities. There is a style of writing that's a sense of place about Michigan. Not everyone does, but you, you can pick it out. Um, whether you're whether they're poets like Jim Daniels, who grew up in Detroit, who writes about the auto industry, or, or Jim Harrison, who writes primarily about uh, out back of Michigan, you know, the UP, and some of the forests and woods. Uh, you can see that. And I grew up here, so I guess that's part, you know, that's part of it. I think it's, I grew up here and had a lot of the same experiences that they had growing up. Um, I remember telling uh, Tom Blaine once uh, that in one of his books he talks about surfing on Lake Sinclair. And I said, you got to kid me. We, and how you did it. It's the same way I did it when we were in the Saginaw River. You swam out to a freighter, which was going nonstop. I mean, they were going so fast back then. And you, you had built surfboards, and you pushed off the side of the freighter. I thought we were the only people in the world that had done that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, said, I've subsequently found like five other people, including Tom McGuane. It's just, I've, there's something about Michigan. You do similar yeah. things, so you read about similar things. I think that's part of it. I really do. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.